All right, everybody, welcome back to part three of the history of Russia. Roger says, hey. So I really appreciate all of the comments that you guys left on my video from yesterday. I did read through them this morning, learned a lot of really great stuff from all of you, and I'm going to be highlighting some of those here in a minute. But interestingly enough this morning, I don't know if you guys have heard of Wondrium before. This is not a sponsored video or anything, but it used to be called The Great Courses, and now it's under a new name called Wondrium. And I watch that sometimes in the morning while I'm eating breakfast. There's so many classes you can take on it. This morning I logged on and there were was a suggestion for a video on the sort of Russian Ukraine situation going on and it was this episode right here. Now this is a course called um, The History of Eastern Europe. This is on Wondrium as you can see up here. If you guys are interested in checking it out there's like a monthly subscription for it but um, there are so many wonderful courses on here that you can learn from and they recommended this uh, lecture 23 the unfolding Ukraine Russia crisis. Now this was filmed prior to what's going on now but it was filmed post 2014 when uh, Putin annexed Crimea. So it was a fantastic lecture on kind of the history of Ukraine and Russia along with Europe, you know, the relationship there. Also explaining some of the more modern, you know, things going on there and the, the background of that. When I went through and read your comments, I saw a lot of you referring to things that uh, this lecture talked about, which if I hadn't watched this lecture, I probably wouldn't have understood completely what you were talking about in the comments. Yeah, if you guys are interested in this subject, I would definitely recommend checking out this course, the history of Eastern Europe on Wondrium, and I might actually go through the entire course on my own here. Unfortunately, these are probably not videos I could do reactions to, but I do recommend it if you guys are interested. So anyway, let's go and check out some of your comments from yesterday. We're gonna do comment time, and this is where I just take a handful of your comments and highlight them and kind of talk about them really quickly. If you don't want to watch this, there are chapter markers in this video. You can skip right to the reaction. Let's go ahead and take a look at your comments. So our first comment is from Jay Nightingale. They said that the reason that Mikhail was chosen was that he was one of the strongest ties to the last legitimate ruler slash czar. His older father was also a choice, but at the time was a POW of Poland and was also a priest of the Orthodox Church, which means that he couldn't rule as to be a priest. One must give up any right to rule. I guess that means that he, since he was a priest, he wasn't able to rule. Um, it was often used in medieval Europe to get rid of nobles or family members without having to kill them. So I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to on that last sentence. What was often used in middle in medieval Europe? You're talking about uh, them being priests and not being able to rule or the choosing of the person with the strongest ties to the last legitimate ruler. Uh, Staffan says, I would like to point out that it is a design choice that the borders on the maps look blurry. That way they don't have to spend too much time or energy on drawing the exact borders. The borders in Europe were most Mostly well defined at this time, although ever changing because of war. Okay, well, that's good to know while watching this. I guess a design choice would explain why the borders were a little less defined than I had envisioned them to be. And a lot of you in, in the comments also said that it was very much natural borders that defines, you know, the quote unquote countries. And I did see one comment that said that uh, that was more so the case in Western Europe where there were a lot more natural boundaries. And then in Eastern Europe is, is a lot of just kind of like flat, ambiguous land. So there's not a whole lot there to separate things, which made it more vulnerable to attacks and so forth. And so that's why it was probably a little less stable than Western Europe, which makes a lot of sense. It's crazy see how geography can influence geopolitics, right? Which I guess that's the geo part of geopolitics. Uh, Joshua Wells says, in monarchies, a regency is when a regent, typically a relative or powerful nobleman, rules in place of a monarch who ascends to the throne at a very young age. They rule until that monarch comes of age, which being of age varies but usually around 15 to 18. As for the Seven Years' War, Americans know it better as the French and Indian War, which was the American theater of a more global conflict. In fact, some scholars call this the First World War, um, not to be confused with World War I. I have heard that about this war, actually. Yes, we would have learned it as the French and Indian War over here, and I do know that I we did learn about that in history class. It's just that it's been so long that I don't really remember anything about it. So I'm gonna have to go back and, and 
you know, kind of watch some videos and learn, re kind of relearn it, I guess. And a lot of you guys said that the reason that the rulers in in Russia were so young is because the life expectancy was really short, you know, 30 to 35 years. So when you hit, I guess, age 15 or so, you were basically considered an adult at that point. It's crazy to think about now because we think of those those ages as kids still. I guess it's all relative, right? A uh, stable Knievel? Is that right? <laughs> Confusingly, there are a few places called Azov or Azov in that part of the world. From its location on the map, I suspect the one that they're talking about here is the one that's firmly inside Russia. Uh, open street map for the win. <laughs> I guess so. I just, uh, I, I had no idea that there were multiple ones. Um, I just saw that and thought it was the one that, um, you know, was under attack in Ukraine, but okay, good to know. Gofili says that a short lesson in German, IE is pronounced like the English EE, -E, so E, and EI is pronounced like the English I. Most English speakers get confused by these two. Yeah, I would, I would have a hard time remembering which is which. The B, which somebody called that like a double B or something, I'm not sure, is a special German letter designating the sharp S or SC, so it would be pronounced Meisen or Meisen, is that right? Meisen? Well, thank you guys. There were a few of you who left this uh, sort of German grammar lesson for me in the comments, so I appreciate that. Evelation X says, it wasn't just Russia that had a string of young but competent rulers. Charles the 12th of Sweden that fought Peter the Great was only 15 years old. Napoleon uh, wasn't even 30 when he defeated Austria and declared himself the supreme ruler of the French Empire. Alexander the Great had just turned 20 when he invaded the Persian Empire. Augustus Caesar was 19 when he founded the Roman Empire. European history was essentially written by young men that had an appetite for getting into fights <laughs> with everyone. Uh, I really like this comment because it does highlight that, that I was completely wrong about young rulers being the exception rather than the rule. It seems like it was more of the rule, especially back then. It's crazy to think though that like you grow up that quickly once you hit like maybe your mid-teens, then all of a sudden you're like doing adult things, you know? But yeah, it's a really, really Really good point how different the world was back then I guess. All right so I'm gonna leave your comments there. I really appreciate again you leaving all of them. So we're gonna go ahead and get into part three of the history of Russia. We left off with Catherine the Great. She had just come into power and they kind of left me hanging with some uh some stuff she was gonna do for the the great Russian Empire. I did learn today in that lecture I, I watched on Wondrium that she I think annexed part of Ukraine or Ukraine and kind of brought that under Russian rule. I also learned about the treaty that was signed with the Cossacks and stuff too. Yeah that really really helped put into perspective some of the history between Russia and Ukraine that I just wasn't really sure about. So so anyway let's uh, let's check out part three. In the early 1700s, Peter the Great's reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become Empress of Russia, who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment, and even corresponded with the French philosopher Voltaire. She reigned as an enlightened autocrat. Her power was unchecked, but she pursued ideals of reason, tolerance and progress. Catherine became a great patron of the arts and learning. Schools and colleges were built. The Bolshoi Theatre was founded as well as the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts, wow. while her own magnificent collection of artwork now forms the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. Catherine encouraged Europeans to move to Russia to share their expertise and helped German migrants to settle in the Volga region, where they became known as Volga Germans. Their communities survived nearly 200 years, until, on Stalin's orders, they were deported east at the start of World War II. Oh. Catherine's reign also saw enormous territorial expansion. 
In the south, Russia defeated the Ottoman Empire, winning new lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt, led by the renegade Cossack Yemelian Pugachev. Okay, I the see. Um, I see Azov. Okay, um, yeah, that is in Russia. <laughs> I didn't notice. I, I I didn't have my orientation of this map yesterday completely like worked out. So Crimea is on the extreme like eastern southeastern coast of Ukraine. So Ukraine actually would have been up in in this area, kind of going up into Poland and Lithuania. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for some reason yesterday you had Ukraine like in this area and I just, that's just my fault for not properly orienting where Crimea was down here. So yeah, this is uh, definitely in Russia. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't catch that yesterday. Let me uh, back up here just a little bit. New lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt, led by the renegade Cossack Yemelian Pugachev. The rebels took many fortresses and towns and stormed the city of Kazan before they were finally defeated by the Russian army. Catherine then forcibly incorporated the Zaporozhian Cossacks into the Russian Empire and annexed the Crimean Khanate, a thorn in Russia's side for 300 years. Russia's new lands in the south were named Nova Russia. New Russia. New Russia. I learned that this morning. Sparsely populated, they were settled by Russian colonists under the supervision of Prince Potemkin, Catherine's advisor and lover. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, exhausted by war and at the mercy of its neighbours, was carved up in a series of partitions, with Russia taking the lion's share. Poland did not re-emerge as an independent nation until 1918. Wow, Russia that inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who, Catherine decreed, could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement, were excluded from most cities. My question about this right here is in that lecture this morning, they kept, he kept referring to Ukrainians and kind of that area called Ukraine, but we're not seeing that on this map here. There's no Ukraine anywhere. So is it just kind of like a thing where the people that lived in that region, no matter what it's called on this map, for instance, there's, they just identified as Ukrainians? Is that what they just called themselves? There's a video I found on YouTube that's the history of Ukraine. So I'm gonna have to probably watch that maybe to fully understand this concept. But I just don't understand where Ukraine, Ukrainians came from because I haven't seen that really at all on any of these maps. So does it just gotta go back to where <laughs> Did they just start calling themselves Ukrainians at some point? I guess I, that, that's what I'm that's what I'm not getting here. Got that last bit. Russia inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who Catherine decreed could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement, oh. who were excluded from most cities. In France, the French Revolution led to the execution of King Louis the Sixteenth. Catherine was horrified, and in the last years of her reign, completely turned her back on the liberal idealism of her youth. Three years later, Catherine died, ending one of the most glorious reigns in Russian history. She was succeeded by her son, Paul, a man Just obsessed Paul. <laughs> by military discipline and detail, and opposed to all his mother's works. Russia joined the coalition of European powers, fighting revolutionary France. Marshal Suvorov, one of Russia's greatest military commanders, won a series of victories against the French in northern Italy. But the wider war was a failure. Meanwhile, Paul's reforms had alienated Russia's army and nobility, and he was murdered in a palace coup. He was succeeded by his 23-year-old son, Alexander, 
who shared his grandmother Catherine's vision for a more modern Russian state. His advisor, the brilliant Count Mikhail Speransky, reformed administration and finance. Yet the emperor refused to back his plans for a liberal constitution. Ultimately, it was war with France that would dominate Alexander's reign. France had a new emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, who inflicted a series of defeats on Russia and her allies at Austerlitz, Eilau and Friedland. But at Tilsit in 1807, the two young emperors met and made an alliance. Russia attacked Sweden, annexing Finland, which became an autonomous Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire. But then, in 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia. At Borodino, French and Russian armies clashed in a gigantic battle, one of the bloodiest of the age. Napoleon emerged victorious, but the Russian army escaped intact. Napoleon occupied Moscow, which was destroyed by fire. And when Alexander refused to negotiate, the French army was forced to make a long retreat through the Russian winter, and was annihilated. By the way, um, if you guys are newer to my channel, uh, I've done all of the Napoleonic Wars videos from Epic History TV, and you'll find a playlist of them on my channel if you want to go and check, check those out. Uh, but yeah, I just thought I'd mention it while they're talking about it. Also, uh, I see now when Russia annexed Finland, I didn't really understand how Finland uh, was part of Russia prior to that. Also, where, the, where did the name Finland come from? Because that was Sweden. So did Russia just name it Finland? Napoleon had been dealt a mortal blow. And Russia, alongside Prussia, Austria and Britain, then led the fight back, which ended in the capture of Paris and Napoleon's abdication. At the Congress of Vienna, as part of the spoils of war, Alexander became King of Poland. Then, with Austria and Prussia, he formed the Holy Alliance, with the aim of preventing further revolutions in Europe. Meanwhile, in the Balkans and Caucasus, Russia had been waging intermittent wars against the Ottoman Empire, Persia and local tribes. The frontier had been pushed south to incorporate Bessarabia, Circassia, Chechnya, and much of modern Georgia, Dagestan, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. But the peoples of the Caucasus bitterly resisted Russian rule. Russia's attempt to impose its authority on the region led to the Caucasian War, a brutal conflict fought amongst the mountains and forests that would drag on for nearly 50 years. Oh my gosh. Alexander was succeeded by his brother Nicholas, a conservative and reactionary. But parts of Russian society had now developed an appetite for European-style liberalism, including certain army officers who'd seen other ways of doing things during the Napoleonic Wars. They saw Nicholas as an obstacle, and the new emperor's first challenge would be military revolt. All right, well, they always leave me on a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah, so now I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with Nicholas. I'm assuming that he gets removed from power, you know, but I, I don't know. Also, it was interesting to see the, the was it the, called the Holy Real Alliance? Is that what it was? Between Austria, Prussia, and Russia to an alliance to prevent further wars in Europe. Obviously, it didn't work out in the long run, but it is interesting to see stuff like that going all the way back a couple hundred years where they were trying to make these alliances to, pre to prevent war. Kind of like, I guess, the NATO sort of in the modern day, maybe. Uh, obviously, Russia's not part of NATO, but sort of like the same idea, right? These alliances to try and prevent war, which again, you know, <laughs> not, not too uh, effective, you know, uh, with 
what's going on over there now. Hopefully the war gets contained though and doesn't, you know, spread to the rest of Europe. So we're all, we're all uh, keeping our fingers crossed with that, I guess. Yeah, again, another great video. I'm so glad I watched that lecture earlier. Again, I can't recommend it enough if you guys are interested in just going and checking out Wonderim. I think they have maybe a free trial too, so if you just want to sign up for the free trial and go watch it, maybe you can do that too. But yeah, this is so fascinating. This is just a part of history that I've never, you know, really learned about. Some of these names are familiar. Obviously, Alexander the First from the Napoleonic Wars, I recognize. I recognize Catherine the Great and Peter the Great from history, but again, it's just like these little names of things that pop up that I can remember learning when I was a kid, but can't tell you anything about it now because it's been such a long time. So I, I'm really enjoying um, kind of learning about this this area, this this era of history in this area of the world that has just been a complete mystery to me. I wish that uh, more Americans, and maybe not just Americans, but just people all over the world who are curious about what's happening over there right now, don't have that historical context for it. I wish people would really start to look into it because it would really, really help, I think, understand the current situation over there. The more you know about the history of it, the better you're gonna understand it and not be so ignorant about it. Yeah, I really, really wish people would take the time to do that, but I can only control what I do and I am really interested in this topic and will be learning more about it, even probably beyond, beyond these videos as well. Just a reminder to like this video and subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Make sure to leave a comment down below if you have something you want to add to the discussion or answer my questions. You can also go to the description of this video and the pinned comment that I have to find all of my links to social media. There's also a link to, to my Patreon where I do videos that I don't do over here on YouTube. I do some uh, like TV series, documentary series and stuff over there that I can't really post on YouTube. So if you're interested in checking that out, the link to my Patreon is down there. You can just go and look, look and browse and see what I've got to offer there. And I also have a Star Trek podcast. So if you're a Trekkie, you might want to check that out. The link is also there with everything else. So anyway, we'll be doing part four next, I guess, going into uh, Nicholas the first, seeing what happens with him. And yeah, I'm really enjoying the series. Epic History TV is such a really good channel. I need to probably do more of their stuff. Anyway guys, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.